We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. As social media works too, we're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way is for questions to come through the website. That way they don't get lost. We're not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Tonight, we're going to remind everyone that tabletop doesn't just mean board games to us with an RPG topic. Today's question comes from Brent, McBr uh, Bent Mc Brent McBride, the owner of Hidden Trail Escape Rooms down in Windsor. Brent asks, I have almost no experience in playing D&D or any role-playing games, but I think I would have a blast being a DM eventually. What's the fastest path to being a solid GM? DM? Well, thanks for the question, Brent. Uh, one quick thing, we're going to swap between DM, GM, Master of Ceremony, whatever term, the person who facilitates the game. Also, I want to really thank Brent and Hidden Trail Escape Rooms for stepping up and helping us out here in Windsor for our 2019 Extra Life efforts. Brent personally took over running our escape room, as well as donating an eight-person escape room experience to our live auction. Brent's been supporting us since he first opened Hidden Trail, and it's greatly appreciated. Indeed. Thank you, Brent. Now, ever since the Bellhop team attended BreakoutCon 2019, there's a certain phrase we keep repeating, and we keep repeating it multiple episodes. Uh, the first time we heard it was at Breakout, and that is fail faster. Now, while the panel we first heard it on, and the context most of the time is going to be in regards to game design, I think it really applies here as well. Because the fastest and best path to becoming a better GM, DM, Master of Ceremonies, Hollyhock God, or whatever you want to call the person sitting at, at the, the head of the table, the best way is to actually get behind the screen, get to the table, and do it. The sooner you run your first game, and the sooner you start learning what you did right and what you did wrong, the better. You will only learn to run a game by running it. You can read all the rule books, memorize them if that's your thing, but that doesn't mean you're ready. To me, in many ways, running an RPG is like getting into a fight. You just don't know how you're going to react until someone throws that first punch or that first die. So don't be as adversarial as you might be <laughs> while in a fight. But honestly, the more games you run, the more often, the better you're going to get. Facilitating an RPG session is a skill. And like any skill, it's going to get better with practice. And one of the only ways it's going to get better is with practice. Since running games is a social thing, the best way to get that practice in is to actually sit down and run games for other people. Don't put it off. Don't wait for some magical place in your life where you're going to feel ready. Now I'm ready to DM. Now I'm fully prepared. Trust me, I have been running games for many, many years, and you never hit that place where you're 100% ready and 100% ready and confident in your skills. And just, I'm the best DM. I'm ready to go. It's never going to happen. You're always going to be second-guessing yourself, always going to be worrying. Now, there are some things you can do away from the table to better prepare for running a table and running a game. And we'll get to some of those in a moment, but you don't need to do any of that before you start. Nothing is going to teach you better than actual play time. Yep. You want to learn what works and what doesn't, and then forget all of that because you're in front of a different group that behaves differently than your other group. <laughs> yes, you're going to make mistakes. Uh, you're going to waste time on things you probably shouldn't waste time on. You're going to have to look up things in the books or on the PDF or Google something. You're going to make the wrong call. You're probably going to fail to share the spotlight equally. You're going to highlight the wrong player. You might send someone down a dead end path. The players are going to do things you'll never expect. Now, this is another thing you're going to have to trust me on. This is every game you'll ever run your entire life. That never changes. It's not going to be perfect. It may not even be pretty. Just don't expect things to be awesome the first time. Now, one thing I think can get easily lost is that to a greater or lesser degree, depending on the game, the GM is some combination of author, god, computer, and guide. The particular game system you've chosen will impact that balance to a large degree. Uh, without a GM there, players are basically running around with their fingers for guns saying, <laughs> I hit you, no, I hit you, no, I hit you. And it, just as we did as young children. And it's the GM who takes the actions and the ideas of the players and rolls that into a cohesive story based either in a commercial adventure you've purchased or something that you've created yourself from scratch or any combination in between. Now, one of the things that's important when just starting out is 
make sure you disclose, make sure you're obvious, talk about it. Let the table know that you're new to this. Be honest. Disclose your lack of experience. Warn players that you're probably going to make mistakes. I have met very few players over the years who are not going to be cool with this. And if there is one who's not going to be cool with this, you probably don't want to game with them anyway. The fact you're hosting a game for the players isn't going to be lost on them. You're basically there to entertain them, to give them an experience and help facilitate their fun. People are going to appreciate that gesture alone. And more people are going to be willing to forgive not only a few simple mistakes, but big glaring ones as well, because you're there for them. The key, as always, for this is to manage expectations. Yes. Expectation setting should be done in what we call session zero. We've talked about this on the show almost every time we talk about an RPG topic, session zero comes up. This is your first meeting of the group before the first actual game. It could happen the same session. It doesn't have to be like a special day you do it. We've talked about session zero before, but the main point of session zero without doing a whole episode on it is to get everyone on the same page before you start. Making sure everyone's expectations match and everyone knows what they're going to be getting out of the night. This is where you're going to introduce your level of skill and comfort at the table. This is something that should and can be discussed along with everything else like safety tools and things like cats and other things we brought up beforehand. It's worth noting that with an inexperienced GM, the chances are higher that things might drift off track and go somewhere uncomfortable. As well, a safety tool initiated from the very start of your career sets a strong tone of openness and acceptance because people, they know from the beginning that they have the power to say stop. Yeah, and if you don't know what we mean by safety tools, please Google it, please look it up. Again, that's a bigger topic than this particular episode, but it's something that makes the table more inviting and approachable to more players. It is a good thing. We strongly, both of us, everyone I think that listens to this show, everyone in the chat room strongly agrees. This is, it, it is the way games have changed in a positive way to allow for more people to have more fun playing. Now, this leads to my first tip that isn't just sit down and play, play a game. When you are first starting off, you want to try to find the right group to play with. Now, in many cases, this is probably going to be family and friends, people who trust you and who you trust, people who are going to be patient enough to put up with the learning curve. Not only are the players hopefully going to be more forgiving, they're going to be more comfortable running with them. This is a great option to grow with a group. If you can start with players who are new, you're going to be all in the same spot when it comes to learning, and you'll work through things together. Now, some of us are lucky enough to have an existing group already. This is a fantastic place to start. If you're already in a group playing a game as a player, you've already got people there who know you and know what to expect from you, and you know them. If you're interested in running a game, mention it to the group before or after one of your regular sessions. There aren't many GMs out there that aren't going to jump at the chance to have another GM in the group to share the workload and to give each other a break from now and then. I feel like this is a dig at the fact that you were always the DM for us. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 I have no regrets. I have no regrets. As long as I got to play now and then. That's why we used to split up our sessions at the university. I played in someone else's game. It wasn't with the same group of people, but I at least still got a chance to play. Now, if you don't have uh, friends and family to play with or your friends and family aren't interested and you don't have a group, uh, don't panic. Running for strangers really isn't that bad. As mentioned above, you're doing something for these people. You are providing a form of entertainment to them, and they're going to appreciate it. At least, like I said, 99%, most people. And if the people don't, those aren't people you want to game with. Now, trying to find a group is a topic for another show. I'll just reiterate here to make sure you're clear about the fact that you are new to this and ask people to be forgiving because of it. We all had to start fresh somewhere. Now, one recommendation is to check out our episode, Finding Your Yoda, where you can try and find yourself a mentor for both board games, but also for RPGs. All right, my next suggestion for the fast track to becoming a great DM is to pick the right game. Now, there's two things I think that are important to think about here when picking which game to run, and they're almost counter, like they, they almost go against each other, because first off, you want something you're excited about. Being excited about what you are running is honestly my number one GM tip overall. Like if you are going to run a game, be excited to run it. You are going to run a better game as an excited facilitator. And the energy you bring to the table is going to feed off to the players and get other people excited. Being, it, this is enough to drive a game. 
and make everyone completely forget that you used the wrong AC for the orc or forgot the name of an NPC or had to look something up in a book. Yeah, if you love Star Wars and both you and your friends love wrestling, don't maybe jump into playing Star Wars when you could start off with something like Worldwide Wrestling to play to all of your strengths. Then again, if you don't know your group, but you really know Star Wars, that might be your best choice to go with what you know. Mm -hmm. Now, the second part is trying to find a game that fits your skill level. Now, my immediate thought is say, find an easy to run game, find a simple game, find a game with a short rule book or with really simple rules, but that's not necessarily the right answer. It's all about your personal comfort and skill level. Easy doesn't necessarily mean better for new players. Sometimes a mathematically crunchy game with a thousand page rule book is exempt, exactly the, um, the tool a new DM needs. It's, it's, it's a comfort level. It's, it's a um, safety blanket in a way because that game is going to have mechanics for everything. And the physical rules of the game are all there in place already. They're not gonna require improvising. There is an answer to all the player questions. How do I do this? Let us look it up, it's all there. Now an added bonus is that the players that like these crunchy games usually like them a lot. And they tend to come with a level of rule mastery themselves and they can help you facilitate running a game by clarifying and reminding you of rules. Because there is nothing wrong with leaning on player knowledge, especially rule knowledge, while playing a game. Then again, if you're really hoping for something more interactive and improvisational, something like a Fate or a uh, Powered by the Apocalypse game may suit your interests and flexibility better. Again, yeah. knowing what you want out of a game se out of a game session is important here. Yeah, exactly. Some new games. Some new GMs are going to feel comfortable with a stack of rule books to stand behind. Most are probably going to be more comfortable starting off with a rules light system, something without a lot of learning required before the game starts. Now, there are a ton of modern indie games out here that really shine. Like Sean said, anything Fate, Powered by the Apocalypse, Fate Core, or sorry, Fate Accelerated in particular over Fate Core. Uh, there are one-page RPGs out there like Rocker Boys and Vending Machines and Lasers and Feelings. And then card-driven story games like For the Queen, you could get a group of four friends, not that there's a DM in that game, but to get used to DMing and like you open the deck and play. There is no prep. There is no reading the rules. There's no learning to play ahead of time. You just sit down and play. In that case, the facilitator is probably the person that owns the game. Now, while rules light, some of these rely on the GM to be able to craft and move that story along. So while different, they aren't always easier depending on what your confidence level is. Yeah organizing that story versus controlling the rules and letting the players drive the story a little bit more. Yeah, this is why I said like, there's no particularly right, G like, right, right rule book, right? I, I, like, I'd love to tell everyone, go buy the D&D &D Essentials Kit, it's the perfect place. Or go buy the Tales of Equestria Starter Set. Or go pick up Lasers and Feelings or Love and Justice and you'll, you'll have a great time. It, it's based on your own personal comfort level. Where there's where I'd also lead back on what are you more excited to run? So find something you're excited to tell a story about and find a game that can do it. Might be a good way to do it that way. Now, the middle ground is kind of the, the mix, right? The, the, the heavy game with an intro box. This is something that was huge in the 80s. That every role-playing game came in a box set, right? The D&D Red Box, the Marvel Super Heroes Yellow Box, the Star Trek Fast, everything was in a box. And these are kind of starting to make a comeback, which personally makes me really happy because I love these. Most major RPG publishers now put out some type of beginner box for their system. Now, D&D &D actually has like three. There's the, the starter set, which is out. Then they just put out this new essentials kit that was in Target for a while. And then there's the Stranger Things starter set that's trying to get a whole new audience. Now, what these boxes do is walk your entire group, players and GM, through getting into whatever game it is one step at a time. They're written for new players and game moderators alike. And what I love to see is that the modern sets have way more advice for new game masters. And this includes things like how to find a group, what to do before the game begins, how to prep, how to schedule a game night, not just things like how to run a combat in D&D. Now these boxes are often flexible enough that they hand feed you almost everything, but are forgiving if you want to add some of your own flair as well. Yeah, a lot of the good ones, uh, the Pathfinder beginner box is still one of my favorites where it gives you a really simple adventure. There were four other really small adventures online, but then gave you all the tools to keep running that box up to level five. And then once you hit level five, they encourage you to buy the massive tome that is Pathfinder. Like I find these great for intros and I'm like, I almost wish more of the indie games had in intro boxes, but like 
They're usually small enough. They don't need an intro box, but you just don't have that walkthrough. A lot of the indie games seem to assume you've already played D&D at least already or some other role-playing game, which I get because most people who find indie games have already found a mass market game first. But again, you're trying to find a game that fits your comfort level. Uh, skill level is a bad one to say because you might not know your skill level yet, but basically your comfort level with improvising rules, making calls on the fly, and improvising scenes where a intro box set is going to probably provide you all of that. It's going to provide you the scenes. It's going to provide you the math. It's going to provide you the mechanics all right in front of you, step-by-step step, telling you how to play through it. Now, my next tip is to learn from others. One of the most eye-opening things for me growing up with RPGs was the transition from playing with my own personal friends, my cousin in particular, my own family, and then going to a public play place, which was the University of Windsor's Wayne Windsor Gaming Society, and playing under other people, playing in other people's games. Because everyone has their own unique twist on how they run games, different skills they're good at, and different ways to prevent and handle information. The more people you play under, the more you can learn. Like, even now, for years of running games, every time I play with a new GM, I see something new, something I can do better the next time I run. I would almost say it's a rule, almost. Don't run a game if you've never played a game. Now, yeah. that doesn't mean don't run D&D until you've played D&D, but if you've never sat in the chair at an RPG session and felt what it's like to be a player, it can be hard running for others who are sitting in those mm -hmm. chairs. Uh, now, with the exception, of course, being that when there's just no option. Uh, you and your probably young friends really want to play a game but don't even know where to begin, you go out and you buy the Stranger's Thing starter box and one of you chooses to be the DM. Yeah. So nowadays, that's not, like, when, when in the 80s, that's how it was done. Like, I learned how to DM by reading a book and doing it. That, there was no option. I didn't know there were other people who played around Windsor, right? But today, you don't have to join another player's game to basically sit at the table. Every week, tomorrow night, tens of thousands of people are going to watch Matt Mercer run Dungeons & Dragons for the world on Critical Role. Now, along with that, there are a ridiculous number of actual play streams out there. There's probably 500 or more running right now on Twitch while we're live right now. Then there's all the videos on YouTube. And then even more so, audio podcasts, audio-only podcasts, actual plays. If you want to watch or listen to someone else GM a game and try to learn from that, they're just a click away. Now, one important thing to remember, though, some of these people, Matt Mercer in particular, and some of the other streamers are paid professionals people whose livelihood is centered around running games. Their entire professional lives are centered on running an entertaining game for an audience, and they have the time and means to fine hone that craft. It's unlikely you can devote all your downtime to better describing a town in visual detail or spend hours practicing NPC voices in the mirror. Just realize that running a game to entertain an audience is not the same as running a game to entertain a table of players. Don't set them as a bar to hit. I would say, do not think about streaming your initial efforts. Just don't. Learn your craft before diving into the deep end of broadcasting while running a game. They are two separate uh, jobs, essentially. Now, what I would say is, if you were interested in perhaps in the future podcasting or something, record it. Put a recorder mm -hmm. at the table and have that audio stored somewhere in the background and you maybe even go back and learn and you can you can learn from your own playing mm -hmm. and see what happened but don't consider releasing that sort of thing right away focus on the game because if you're trying to stream and broadcast you will be focusing on trying to streaming and stream and broadcast and not on the game in front of you yeah and that's a, that's another tip for again like for any skill or acting in particular or anything where you're presenting watching yourself can be useful. So recording yourself and listening to it afterwards, just don't get focused on the fact you're recording. Remember you're there to entertain the other players. Now, watching people run games, either literally watching or playing as a player is a form of research. Now, research is an important part of improving any skill. If you wanna improve your skill at anything, you do some research. Now, when I say research, I think sitting down with a tome of books and reading, well, that applies to DMing as well. There are a surprising number and growing number of books being published on the topic of running role-playing games and doing a better job of it. Now, personally, I'm going to give a shout out to the books by Engine Publishing. Um, I'm a huge fan of Never Underprepared, Unframed, and Odyssey in particular, but there are others out there. And then there's the internet. There are any number of blogs, forums, podcasts, videos, and other sites dedicated 
to honing the craft of facilitating an RPG session. Yeah, I feel like this might not need to be said, but we're going to say it for the record anyway. As with anything on the internet, be wary of unmoderated content. Alphabeard1947 may speak a lot and very confidently, but that doesn't mean you should listen to any of what they have to say. There are still gatekeepers out there saying things like, if you've only played X, you're not a real gamer. Yeah. And this is a family podcast, so instead of what I actually feel, I will simply say they're wrong, very wrong. All right, to bring things back to the beginning, uh, there are a lot of things out there that can make you a better game master. There's books and blogs to read, podcasts and videos to watch and listen to. Uh, you can play under a variety of different moderators or watch them on stream or and learn from what they're doing. But nothing is actually sitting down and running a game yourself. Listen to the memes. Listen to Shia LaBeouf. Just do it! But maybe not listen to him on anything else. <laughs> Now, I'm sure there's other things people can and have done to help hone their GM skills, especially as a new GM. Things to fast track their path to GM greatness. I want to know what these things are. Let us know your tips for new GMs in the comments or hit us up on social media or send me an email, mo at Tabletop Bellhop or find me on the web, Tabletop Bellhop, one word everywhere. I want to hear your tips and we'll share them in our next episode. Now let's check back into the lobby. So uh, Major Kayla has been in there. Apparently we don't have our uh, normal RPG uh, squads hang in the chat room. But uh, Major Kayla points out, uh, as a GM who only started this year's, the tips she embraced when taking the leap were, one, don't worry if you're not an expert yeah. at the rules. Uh, and if the rules are slowing down the game, hand wave them. Uh, this, and that's a really important thing. You know, as the GM... It's important to understand that you are the god. It, it is your world. And even though there is a rule in a book somewhere that tells you how to do something, you don't have to follow it. Right. Uh, it's, you know, you are the god. And, uh, and, and that's one of the reasons why I think I took it out of the comments, my comments along the way is you kind of want to avoid rule lawyers at your first table. Uh, <laughs> while they can be helpful helping you find rules, uh, again, Sticking to the rules religiously isn't always the best thing for a game. Again, it, it depends in a way, because there are a certain group of gamers, a certain style of play that are very much mechanical, almost competition style gaming. If we're looking at Dungeons and Dragons, Adventure League, Pathfinder, uh, organized play, organized play games. If you're going to run an organized play game, there is an expectation of rules knowledge. And there are people who love to play those games and min and max their characters and follow all the rules and do it a certain way. And part of the joy they get out of that is, especially in the organized play, is that it's a shared experience. So after playing the game, I could play in Windsor, Sean could play in Toronto, and then we can get together and talk about the adventure. And we would have had a very similar experience because the mechanics, if handled properly, would have been identical in both the games. True. So there, there is a style to play where that is encouraged. But, but, I, but I, think for, for, I, think for a new, I think for a new DM... Uh, aiming for competition level DM of D and D is probably a bit uh, over. It's just a lot of GMs get in through the Adventures League nowadays because right. okay. that's where you're going to find players. Players are right. people playing D and D. There, there are six tables I think at the L FLGS now that are running, and that's where a lot of new DMs get their start nowadays. Yep. So it's just a, it's a matter again of knowing your table, knowing your players, knowing your own skills. Uh, next My point to that is yep. rely on the players. If you're yep. playing a game like Pathfinder. And especially if you show up to like an eventually or Pathfinder Society game, I will almost guarantee you the other people at that table are going to know those rules without having to reference the rule book. Use them. There's and no that, reason. And that not rolls to. right into Mage Killer's second point. When in doubt, ask the players to table source yes. or ask them open ended questions. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, if you don't have, if, if your players have run off into a part of the world that you hadn't scoped, hadn't scripted yet, ask them questions about things and, and use that time to scramble together a piece of story to fill it in yeah. and get them back on track or, uh, you know, help them, help them fill in some blanks along the way. They're there as a resource as much as, you know, yes. part of the story. Yeah, uh, part of the thing to remember is this is a change in mentality for gaming over the years is it used to be the players showed up and expected the DM to entertain them. And while that is still part of it, you are still a facilitator, you are the, you, you, you have a leadership role as a GM, and it is up to you to incur and make sure that everyone's having fun. It's no longer just the DM's responsibility that everyone 
have fun and build the story. Everyone should be working together to make an enjoyable shared experience. And that is something indie gaming, things like The Forge have driven out, and I think it's a fantastic change to the game. It's no longer the DM having to come up with everything. Source the table, use the people at the table. Now, not every character person is going to be comfortable making up everything, but you can still ask people. And, and that's part of it, too, is don't feel there's a wall between you and the players. You can ask, are you having fun? Am I doing this right? Do you mind if I do this? Hey, I need 15 minutes because you guys just went somewhere I wasn't expecting. Can you give me 15 minutes to flip through the book and figure out what should be next if you're running a module or to come up with something? Um, there's no shame in admitting that you're you're learning and you're new and the players, like the, most players are going to be proud of the fact they just stumped you, to be <laughs> honest. They, they tend to get pretty happy when they stump yep. the DGM. So they're going to appreciate you taking the time rather than just trying to keep the momentum, keep going and keep going and just making things up and things snowballing, yep. have that conversation. There's no reason not to stop the game and talk about it. And uh, and then her last point uh, on, on that first post is, and now this is for people who are using their doing their own campaigns and not uh, necessarily working out of a book, but don't over plan. Basic mm -hmm. plot, villain and important clues, enough for an index card, the players won't do what you want them to do anyway. No, they won't. So, you know, your your players will just do whatever they can. I mean, one of the one of the reasons uh, video games tend to feel like they're railroading you is because the the gamer is always trying to do something else. Uh and unless it's an open world game, you know, you can only program so many yeah. variables in there. Yeah, so. plan plan don't that we talked about setting expectations for the table. Set your own expectations, right? Don't, you're not telling, you're not writing a novel. You're not telling a story. You are creating a story with the players and there has to be room for that to develop. Okay. If you've got this massive plot and this is going to happen and this is going to happen and then this is going to happen and then this character is going to do this and then this, you're writing a novel. You're not writing an RPG adventure. Yep. You want to generally nowadays almost play to discover what happens and the fact that all you need is a starting spark, something to get things going and the players will take it from there. Yep. You know, have some, have some NPCs ready, but don't necessarily have their entire li life planned out for them because they may never get to that point where you had planned on introducing that NPC. You're going to need to walk that MP NPC in, th in through the back door or they'll never see them. Yeah. Flexibility. The biggest thing is do it. Like, seriously, yeah. get out there, play, run a game, get, go online, run it through Skype, run it on, on go on Twitter, say, hey, I want to run my first game. I, I'm really nervous. Will someone play a game with me for the first time? I bet you get people jump to join. Yeah. Go to the local game store. They, they probably, assuming your local game store has an RPG night, ask if anyone's looking for GMs. If you got your existing group, seriously, mention it to the DM. There are going to be some DMs out there like, no, no, it's my game. Then you might have to look for another night. Or, or maybe you ask the players, hey, you guys come over here on Wednesday. So how about you head to my place next Tuesday? Yep. We don't interrupt this game. We don't end this game, but we start something new. But just do it. Like, it, yep. it's it's not nearly as scary or as intimidating or, to be honest, as hard as some people make it out to be. Yep. Yes, it's a skill, but you're going to get better. It's It's no magical... There's no magical GM gene that some people are born with and some people aren't, and they're just naturally good at it. It doesn't exist. Yep. Uh, and Evil John in the chat room put up one of our other favorite uh, favorite sayings, as well as, uh, you know, fail fast, fail often. You can't be afraid to kill your darlings, right? Yep. If, you know, if you have gone ahead and decided to write a whole bunch of plot, that's great. You know, we're not necessarily saying don't do it, but if you have done it, be aware that you might have to just toss it, yep. right? The, the players, the players uh, to went honest, to a different city. I don't city. think it's worth the amount of prep work that most people put in, right? Like just nowadays, it's not as expected. If you want that run of published adventure, right? Go pick up Secrets of Salt Marsh or Descent into Avernus or whatever, where someone who's paid professionally to do all that work has done it all, and then go in and twist a few things, right? Well, I mean, you know, they, I I would hate to say don't because there may be aspiring art, art artists out, or art, you know writers out there who really want to get involved in that sort of things. And that's great. Uh, again, you know, so I don't want to. I don't want to say don't do it, but just be again. Be aware. You never know what's going to happen. Uh, Evil John I, saying, "I enjoy the enjoy the process of writing, so I tend to go a little heavy on the plot." Again, you just have to make sure you're not writing the story. Right. It's got to be about the characters. It's got to be about the players and what they choose to do. You don't want to be writing fanfic, right? Like, 
you're you, the story is theirs, not yours. You're there yep. to facilitate. Yep. All uh, right. Uh, what else have we got going on in there? I uh, think anything? if we keep up, we're probably just going to get into generic GM tips anymore. <laughs> I think we're moving away from here's All ways right. to become a new DM quicker and become a solid DM. But yeah, play. Actually play. Play at other people's tables. That's big. Play under other DMs. If you can't, watch them. Right? Uh, you can do that nowadays. I, I'm sure on Twitch right now, you could find a million. Don't do it yet. Wait till the show's over. But go to the D&D channel and just scroll through the ridiculous number of people streaming their live stream their live stream games. You can watch other people play, listen to actual play podcasts, uh, read books on it. They, they're out there. A, a surprising number of books, some written extremely well with some great tips you may not have thought of. But do it. Get to the table. Get running games. So that's it for this week's Ask the Bellhop segment. If you'd like to read more about gaming and game advice, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Gaming Advice. Now remember, if you got a question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com.